All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Welcome, everybody, to Mission Assurance through Embedded Data Security Encryption Stack Layer Strategies. Boy, is that a mouthful. <laughs> what the heck does that mean? Data, data everywhere, as we all know. Data is pretty important, and as we heard in the one of the uh, lunchtime sessions, uh, we are some, some congressmen are worried about the electrical grid, and yet the number one threat to the electrical grid today is squirrels. <laughs> you all know that, right? <laughs> some of the largest outages that we've had in recent years have been attributed to little rodents chewing through and getting zapped pretty badly. Um, but seriously, I, I, was at a, I was at a luncheon uh, a little while ago with some folks from the Department of Defense who were involved in, uh, in threats and risks to uh, their standard of life. And I just happened to ask, you know, so what, what are you worried about? What would you say to somebody who's trying to prepare for the next big catastrophe out there? And he said, well, you know what? I can live without electricity for quite a while, but humans can't live without water for more than a couple of days. So he stores water in his basement. I don't know how many of you do that. I know my friends from California have these big tubs of water that they're, that they're prepared for. But we're talking about data today. All right, what walks out of agencies on a regular basis? If we think that our adversaries are inside of our organization, um, what is it that's being stolen? Typically PII, sensitive data, and so forth. And what we'd like to do today is have a discussion around, all right, what are some strategies to use? Some easy buttons, if you will, although nothing is ever easy, but what are the ways that we can protect our data and protect our missions uh, by doing so? Originally, we had uh, Howard White from, there was the CISO for the FDIC. He got called out to another meeting, and so I replaced him with the venerable William Bocci here. I'm gonna have him introduce himself in just a moment. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also Stan Wisseman, and I'll have him introduce himself as well. And then we'll get right into it. We're gonna do like 10 minutes, 15 minutes of talking about uh, data protection. Then we're gonna break out, since this is a learning hub, we're gonna break out into uh, just a couple of individual tables and have open discussion with you all and figure out, you know, what are you doing? What are you, how are you strategizing? Or allow you to ask questions of, of some of our folks. All right, so I'll uh, start with Stan here. Stan, would you introduce yourself, please? Certainly. So Stan Wisman, security strategist with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, previously, I was the CISO at Fannie Mae. Also was with Booz Allen. I got my start in my career at NSA back in the early 80s. And Bill Bocci, I'm the director for data security for also for HPE from our software, uh, software space. And been in the security world for a long time, and, and we kind of had this, we were able to look at a different approach on how to protect data. So it really caught my interest and been doing it for about a year and a half now. But, but it really, you know, it's a, it's a different way to attack and to protect, and it, it's just a, a great little technology. Yeah, and as we've heard on these recent uh, panels, we hear about lots of things. Two-factor authentication, three-factor authentication. Um, you've got firewalls, you've got IDSs, you've got DLP. I mean, there's lots of strategies that we're using to either try to keep people out, or if you can't keep them out, what do you do? What are they after? What is the adversary after? Stan, what so, are they after and who, who are we trying to protect it from? So a lot of times, let's face it, the attackers, the bad actors are after monetizing your data, or they're after a certain IP. We heard it from James this morning. You know, the Chinese are, are, are very good at going after certain IP targets whether it be um, jet fighter design plans, um, or <laughs> you're shaking your head yes, it, yeah, they, they, they succeeded. <laughs> um, it, or monetization, you know, if you look at your, your credit card information, your, your EHR, your um, personal data, uh, and taking advantage of that. Uh, they can also leverage information to uh, potentially um, do extortion. Uh, we don't know what all they're gonna do with the data they took from OPM, as well as Anthem, and. Uh, you know, they're creating their own Facebook page with all of our information. Um, but uh, that's one of the big worries that we have is monetization and uh, potentially using that information against us as well. 
So adversaries from either within or outside of the United States, all trying to get at data that has some value, Correct. right? Monetary or espionage and so forth. Um, where does this data reside, Bill? Where are you seeing organizations uh, discover uh, their own data? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of organizations tend to know um, the typical PII and PHI when it's in a structured format and, and sitting in you know, di different types of databases and things like that. But where they struggle is there's lots of high value data. Like Stan said, it's data that the enemy wants, right? It's data that your competition wants. You know, and you may not at the time, you may not say, hey, that's not that important piece of data, right? But, but it is to the enemy, to the competition. You know, what do you buy your commodity goods at? Where are you shipping things like that? So very important. So I think everybody knows the typical PII. They know the PHI. They know those type of structured components. But it's really everything else above and beyond. And, and when you look at where it is, hey, if I have a database and I have this free form field in that database, right? Guess what? Could be extremely high value data in there, but I'm not protecting it. Right? I may be protecting different pieces and tokenizing other components. So overall, I think customers are really striving to identify, right? Where is it? I could protect the stuff I know. It's the stuff that I don't know that I need to protect, especially in the structured world. And I think in the last, just to follow up real yep. quick, I mean, I think in the last five plus years, that fencing in of where that data is, is getting to be more and more challenging. As your business units are leveraging SaaS, you know, things are going to the cloud, yeah. as things are on our mobile devices, that data and that sense of I have control, I know where those repositories are, I know where that data is going, the data flow, it's harder to, to have that confidence now. Yeah, and one, one follow up, one of the, the, the gentlemen this morning was speaking, was talking about they went and they said they have 190 applications or something, but when they did their asset inventory, they had 690. And guess what? Back ending all these applications is high value data, right? This is high value assets, high value data that needs to be protected because it tended to kind of streamline because you had to put something here because now you're on the web. You had to put something here because now you're on the cloud. Yet, and everything kept getting distributed, so it really became um, challenging to protect. Right. Due to the OPM breach, there were a couple of out, uh, um, outtakes from, from the breach based on hearings and then the cyber sprint and then eventually the Cybersecurity Act of 2015, which mandated that uh, I think it was like sensitive or PII information had to be rendered indecipherable, all right? But it was data at rest only. Is data ever at rest? Um, data is at rest when it's basically shut off and kind of stored in a closet, right? Because what happens is when you think about data at rest encryption, whether it be disk level, volume level, or at the database level, it kind of is encrypted till it's used, right? So if, if I'm a disk and I boot up, guess what? It's not longer. It's data. It's no longer at rest. It's actually, it's instantiated and it's no longer encrypted, right? So th the way we, we see it is encryption is good right? Decryption is bad. And, and, and what we mean by that is in order for me to pull data off a disk, right, and bring it to an operating system, it needs to be decrypted. Therefore, I increase my attack vector, right? My attack surface. And then what happens is I may then put it in my database to do database level encryption. So now I re-encrypt it. Then I do a SQL query and now I decrypt it again. Then I put it in SSL. So I keep re encrypting and decrypting data and every time I do that, right, what I do is I open up my attack points, right? What does the enemy know? That you're using disk level encryption and database level encryption. So therefore, they don't create malware to go against the disk. They don't create malware to go against this database. They go into the points. And guess what? All of these breaches, Rob talked about Heartland payment system. They all had all those technologies. They had every kind of, you know, perimeter thing that you could imagine. And guess what they did? They went after the data. So folks are kind of doing it, but they're not really saying, what do I need to protect? I need to protect the data, right? What am I protecting? Operating systems, maybe the safe that wraps around the application what's wrapping around the data. They don't want that. They want the data. So the, the idea is focus on what you can do, which is the data. And it goes back to that stepwise approach. I know I have these three structured columns. This is what they're looking for, right? Protect them. Stuff, some stuff I don't know that I need to find in some open text fields and different systems, 
slowly, right, a stepwise approach, protect, get your data as you're going along, then work on your structured data and saying, unstructured data, sorry. I know files and things like that, but files are basically unencrypted and therefore uh, things. So that's mostly Rob. Okay, so in, in summary, what I hear you saying is that it's not sufficient to just protect data when the system is turned off. It must be when the system's turned off, when the system's turned on, when, in, when the data is in use in an application, or even when it's in motion, when it's being moved from one place the, to the, another. The van actors are looking for gaps in your protection. Exactly. Gaps, all right, right. so they're attacking the gaps. Is a legacy system a gap. I hear often, especially in government, that we are running some systems that are 20 or 30 years old and that there are no encryption technologies that could protect a system that old. Is that true? Well, I mean, I don't know if there's no protection that you can apply, but many of those legacy protect, uh, systems are vulnerable. Um, I, I think that even if they are using encryption, many times it's file level, right. file based encryption. And, right. and, and to follow up on that, so if I have an old mainframe, right, and, and typically and I'm not a mainframe guy, I'm old enough to be, but I'm not. A and you think about it, what happens is when you go to encrypt the mainframe and you want to do stuff, it becomes extremely expensive. You need to re-architect the whole system. And typically what you do get is data at rest. But the minute the, the, the system's booted up, it's no longer. So some of the technology that we have and we've been working on is the ability to retain the format. So keep it, to keep it simple, if you have a social security number sitting in your mainframe, if I go to encrypt that mainframe and it may be a primary key table, a primary key, I have to rebuild and restructure the whole thing because the size with the encryption technology I would use is now bigger. So you need to change everything about the system and then you lose the ability to do your joins and referential integrity and, and all that technical stuff. Whereas we have technology today that preserves the format Right, so it's kind of done externally before it gets stored, so it keeps it, if it's a nine character, a nine byte thing, it keeps it at the same thing. So I can protect the data without having to change the system, the structure, or the back end schemas, right? So very big, whereas you could take technology that I could encrypt at a point of sale device, right? And this is FIPS level encryption, which is, you know, mandated by the government. I could encrypt it there, I can encrypt it in a big data platform, and I can encrypt it in the mainframe, with the same type of technology and keep the referential integrity, right? What that basically means is all the guys, the data scientists, what do they say? So you need to leave that in plain text, right? Because I can't run my reports, I can't do my predictions, but you can if Rob Roy is encrypted in 50 different systems all the same way. So he may be encrypted if, someone's, if OPM data was taken, Rob Roy's name would be scrambled, but it would still be Rob space Roy, but in encrypted format, exactly the same. And you could run analytics on it, but if I'm the guy running the analytics, I don't know it's Rob Roy, I just know it's a, you know, US citizen one, right? Kind of if we go back to some of the stuff that's recently been happening. So. All right, so it sounds like you, ha you do have solutions for, for legacy systems. Yes. That's FIPS certified, so yep. it, it is, uh, government agencies can take advantage of that. Um, that sounds really interesting, but the, another challenge that I hear quite often is that um, IRS needs to talk to Social Security, or HHS needs to talk to CDC, which needs to then talk to academia, to hospitals, and to public health centers nationwide. And organizations are worried if they encrypt data, they then can't share that data without decrypting it. Is that an area, and do you see that on the commercial side? Do commercial entities often have a need to share uh, sensitive or PII data with other organizations, and what kind of strategies do they put in so, place for so, that? So, so yeah, I mean, that does occur. I mean, you certainly have partners that you have to share information with. Um, usually there is a, uh, a gateway of some type that would allow you to do that transformation. Um, but, you know, or they have some kind of um, ability to uh, share in such a way that they aren't exposing the data, uh, you know, to any kind of potential attack. Uh, but uh, uh, the data-centric approach that you're talking about, you know, preserving the format, allowing you to do your business logic, um, and also share with others that are in your ecosystem um, in such a way that you can maintain that is, I think, the future because you're reducing those gaps and the potential attack vectors. Right, and, and to follow up on Stan's point, it was, we, we talk about, you know, having data 
at rest encrypted kind of data in motion. And those are that we're using different silos of technology because you have to encrypt, decrypt. But really the key is when I share with partners and things like this, this is the data in use motion, right? So if I happen to be, you know, you, you call up Citibank, who's my bank and, and a customer, they, what, they ask you for a couple things. Like each person has different levels of authority of what data they can see. But when they say, hey, give me, at least at this bank, give me the last four digit social security number, because the first five are encrypted, right? They don't, no matter what you tell them, they don't know anything. They only know that last four. So therefore you can share the information, right? So think about a table of data that has a hundred different fields, right? How many fields would you have to encrypt to make that data useless to the enemy or to your competition or to whatever? How many? And it really depends on the data. You, you know, sometimes it may be 10, sometimes 11, and then I could take that data and say, here you go. Even if I'm OPM, I steal it. If I take 20 of those fields of the 100. It neutralizes the value. It neutralizes the value, right? So in, in the value, but me as an analyst internal, I still get value out of the data by running my analytics because I could see that I need to order this product or this good or service or, you know, I'm shipping around a nuclear material, but I don't know where I'm shipping it to, but I know this encrypted value needs to go, but you still keep the value. But if a customer gets it, not a customer, if, if the bad guy gets it, right, again, high value data, it's meaningless to them. I've heard that, uh, you know, attackers do not go after the encryption because if it's done correctly, it's overly difficult and takes hundreds or thousands of years of current computing power to break that encryption. So it sounds like using a data-centric security approach, protecting the data um, in a transparent way that allows you to continue to use it but not give access to it to those who shouldn't have it uh, is, a, is a great strategy. Now, in, in closing this, and before we move into the tables, I am I, I often hear the last objection is that, well, we need all these people inside the organization in order to get their job done, we need to unencrypt all this data. Uh, and and we, I've heard and we, a report. And, and we've found that that's not the case. I mean, usually. How much, how much work could be done uh, as an estimate without nine, having nine, to unencrypt data? 90% can be done without having to decrypt. You know, that there are 10% of the use cases where you actually need to decrypt the data for certain kinds of activity and operations. Um, so you can, you can protect the data for the majority of the time it's in your, your house, as it were, without having to decrypt it. Now, it depends on the use case and the business right. application, um, but that's the... That's so to identify a user, you wouldn't necessarily need to decrypt an entire telephone number. You can just right. leave exposed the last four digits, and that might be sufficient, as when I call my bank and they ask right. me for the uh, last four of my social security number or something like that. Absolutely. And, and you know, in... And protecting the data and not being able to share like data that's, let's say, back-ended on a database, what happens is companies or organizations then export the data from the database, then they redact the data, then they ship out mail, they put DLP, pro they, they create lots of additional processes where if you just protect the data at the source, you don't have to create these, where are these emails going to, where are all these other information, you just give people access uh, to the system where the data is protected. So information has a life cycle. We know it exists in all forms. You should have policy around it, governance around it. It should have a life cycle. Um, and it sounds like we need to be able to discover it, whether it's in a database, but also I hear lots of people use things like SharePoint. Yep. And they <laughs> store lots of data in SharePoint. And it could have Absolutely. PII inside of those you, files you hear, or you file hear, systems. You hear correctly. <laughs> I hear correctly. So structured and unstructured data. Uh, and there's efforts today to figure out what, what they all have. I've heard controlled unclass information in the federal government, CUI discovery. I hear GDPR, GDPR. Uh, requirements in the private sector uh, to apply, to comply with. That's the general, I, we were told this morning, don't use any more acronyms, general data protection <laughs> Regulation, I believe that it is, is from the EU. If you have uh, EU citizen data. European Union. European Union. <laughs> EU. <laughs> all right. You're all in government, so you know every acronym, right? You make them up yourselves. <laughs> um, so I want to thank the, uh, my, my two cohorts here in, in sharing and talking about uh, data-centric security. We don't have near enough time to explore this topic in detail, but we're going to break out and come to your tables right now. If we can coalesce around, it looks like we have enough people to do like two 
or maybe three tables. We'll all just uh, join you at your tables and have and further this discussion just a little bit. Thank you. <laughs>